All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm one of the co-founders of the Bristol Cable. This is my colleague Alon, also a co-founder. Today we're going to be talking about what we do as a media startup media cooperative and basically how we're aiming to redefine local journalism uh, along investigative lines and sort of like challenge the narratives that local media is boring, local media is uh, corrupt or uh, uh, declining. And we're just going to give a little overview about where we've been and how we got here, take on a couple of the conceptual arguments, look a bit about the specifics that we've done, uh, some of the pieces that we've done, and uh, also we're going to have a bit of time for a question and answer afterwards as well. So but basically a little bit about ourselves first is that n neither of us have um, professional or otherwise um, journalistic experience, don't have much professional experience as such, both work currently in catering, and that will explain one of our investigations, which you'll see later on. Um, and, that, and basically, one of our aims setting up was to look at the local media sector and try to find a way in which it can be revived, if it ever was um, something to be sought after, and if not, redefined, and create something that is both resilient and resourced. And that's the title of our workshop uh, session today is uh, New Ways of Doing invest Investigative journal uh, Journalism as a Cooperative. But the big question right now is how can investigative journalism be resourced? How can it be paid for? How can people uh, make a living basically out of doing this sort of intensive work? Now, as I say, you know, well, I'm going to talk through a little bit about where we've been. We started in... October, we launched properly in October 2014 with our first print edition. That's 10,000 copies of uh, a magazine. Um, we're a membership based model, which means that our sort of business model is, works around members uh, subscribing and becoming a co owner and shareholder in the Bristol Cable from £1 a month, average is about £3 a month. Currently, we have 400 members. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that can help us at least attempt at this alternative model of um, funding, organizing, and provoking quality media on a local level. Um, but the big question really is why? Why is local media important? Why are we doing it this way? And, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the follow-on questions. Um, this is just a little bit about where we've been, but I've just explained that to you, so that's fine. <coughs> now, we're different to local media in what we produce, how we produce it, and who produces it. This is a, a graphic which we designed after some research based around uh, the ownership structures of the Bristol Post, which is the, the main daily newspaper uh, in Bristol. Um, and as you can see, We've got mostly, we've mostly got information, except for a couple of undisclosed ones, on the, s the main shareholders of the Bristol Post, which is a part of a subsidiary of the conglomerate Local World, which publishes over 100 titles around the UK. As you can see, there's a couple of well-known uh, well names here. We've got the Daily Mail and Rothermere, Trinity Mirror, uh, Baron Illiff, and uh, Odie Asset Management. A lot of these have connections in the sort of... Uh, media world, political world, and across cross-sector as well. Now, the problem that we see with local media currently is based around three interrelated issues. One is the ownership. Two is the fact that it's completely and wholly advertising-based. And three is that it's based effectively around reducing costs and how can local media for these shareholders be turned into any other commercial tradable entity? Now, the outcome that we see of all of this is highly restricted content. We see superficial reporting. We see, uh, we, we see superficial reporting, press releases, like we now get press releases as a local media organization, and it's astonishing, anybody that works in the sector, as I'm sure many of you do, will see that within like an hour, a, t a title's been made up, a journalist's name has been put to it, and it's been republished on the website. No scrutiny, no comeback, 
uh, no independent verification, and these are from political parties, businesses, and others, which local media should be investigating and should be holding to account. But aside from that sort of more, um, more insidious type of journalism, the rest is kind of just inane. You get a lot of advertorials, a lot of sort of lifestyle and culture, and effectively advertising-led content. And like I explained, that one of the reasons why that is is because local media, as with much media, particularly dailies, is suffering huge squeezes from the, the free access to content online uh, and the sort of concurrent uh, decrease in advertising revenue, decrease in readership, and sort of the vicious cycle that that entails. Um, but the, so the problem is kind of compounded by the small or big C conservative attitudes, whether that be politically or financially, of the ownership structure, the advertising-based revenue, and the cost pressures, and essentially reverts to having a, a form of journalism. Now, to add to that the sort of overwhelming environment of a decline in trust of journalists and media, and you have a kind of a vicious cycle where you're seeing massive voids within uh, the local media sector um, today. But a reaction to that problem is a compounding of that problem as well. Here's a quote from David Montgomery, who's the CEO of Local World, who I mentioned is one of the major local and regional publishers. And I've got a section of it there, but I'm going to read it in full. This was a leaked document to staff at uh, all Local World titles in 2013. It said, in return, the journalists will offer an attractive platform for this content and a large measure of control, presumably by the police information office. And what he was talking about was how basically journalists were going to be transformed into content harvesters and essentially be skimming information off press releases or off the internet and producing what was then being repackaged up and sold as independent journalism, as verified information, and so on. But the result really is, is that, again, the content declines, therefore the readership declines, the advertising, the advertising revenue declines, and therefore, costs are cut, which means editorial staff declines, which means content declines, which means readership and advertising and so on. The result is that up to the years 2012, and probably more since, but this is the most recent uh, uh, quality data, is that 240 local media outlets have folded in the, years, in the seven years up to 2012, um, with just 70 launches. Now, what's that creating? Is, is that a huge democratic deficit where local councillors, um, uh, local councillors, businesses, and also just the sort of like free flow of information and ideas and interesting features aren't getting the space that they need uh, on the local level. What we're proposing is an alternative, and the, the sort of the, the basis of what we're proposing as an alternative, and it is still just a proposition. Uh, as in it's not necessarily been proven to be a, a working model at this time, is that we need to make the case that media is a public good and therefore people should be able to and want to pay for it and therefore can, uh, can it sustain itself. And we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to change what it determines how the revenue is made and how we can find a way effectively to make where high quality content and sustainability aren't at odds, which is what effectively the local media uh, um, industry at this moment is doing. They're prioritizing sustainability by sacrificing high quality content, which is in turn affecting sustainability in the first place. So as where as we see a void in the local media provision, it's actually potentially a niche. Now Alon's just going to talk a little bit about our um, uh, model and our proposed alternative. So yeah, if anyone wants to kind of interrupt and put your hand up and get involved in the conversation and feel free as well. Uh, Adam's kind of covered some of the main areas like the landscape of local media which I'm sure like many people are familiar with and like the sort of issues that Adam's just raised over here kind of led us to a point where we were asking ourselves how can we as kind of a collective of people fund an alternative media organisation with you know pretty much no grant money, no personal capital, no kind of wealthy investors and then at the same time also kind of address the democratic deficit 
as an organization, as a whole structure, how it operates, but also editorially as well. You know, people have been talking about how, you know, editorial structures and control can be shifted in like in, in the 21st century. So that kind of took us to cooperatives. And we don't hold up cooperatives as this, as this sort of like infallible model. And there definitely, there isn't one type of cooperative. There are many, obviously, as well. But all across different sectors, we've seen kind of a, a rise of localism, a rise of different cooperatives, whether it's in food or local businesses. But the principle of applying kind of common ownership to media hasn't really taken off. Like there are a few examples where you can look at perhaps like the New Internationalist or some other kind of like internationally focused magazines. But on a local level, um, there hasn't at least kind of recently been like a drive to create common, co common ownership. If you look 100 years back, the, you know, the Bristol Post, for instance, which is the main title in Bristol today, was actually born out of local people deciding that they needed you know, a publication which was commonly owned. So that's quite interesting that there are those like historical um, examples that have been forgotten. Um, so we kind of looked at the cooperative model and tried to blend it with media and in turn flipped kind of the traditional ownership model on its head. And, um, and by doing so, democratize like a media source, but also looked at it as a way to generate money through membership. Back in 2013, um, kind of we came up with the idea and then we took it to the streets. We were knocking on people's doors. We were like going to, down to youth clubs, boxing clubs, um, universities, speaking to lots of different people and just like posing this idea of like the actual concept in its, in its raw form. And um, off the back of that, we, yeah, we spoke to several hundred people. We held a big um, kind of community consultation. Off that community consultation, we formed like th the first working group and over the months started like kind of ref refining the idea and turning it into actually something which, you know, was, was starting to take flight. And then we got a, yeah, we got a 1,500 pound grant. We achieved some crowdfunding money. That was like a major boost for us as well. We crowdfunded small amount, uh, 3,300 quid, over 100 people donated to that. And we decided instead of putting that into website or putting that into staffing costs whilst we were working kind of part-time in kitchens or restaurants or whatever else, we put that into 35 hours of free workshops which we put across the city and went out to, and over 300 people participated in those workshops from low budget filmmaking to the basics of writing a news report to photography. And the idea behind that was to really kind of galvanize people to get involved who might not otherwise. If we just, you know, put up a, an advert on a website saying, you know, get involved, probably be appealing to, you know, a, a small kind of demographic. Our idea was, you know, really trying to get out there people who might not otherwise take part in such a venture, but are absolutely like a part of our communities. And, um, and then off the back of those workshops, we, f we, we formed working groups to create the first edition, which some of you might have picked up over here as well. And yeah, like more generally speaking, like as the model has developed, we've looked at, you know, like the organization has developed and we've, we've had, you know, issues that have arisen and we've addressed them. And, you know, that's still like, we're still in that birthing period. But a lot of people look at cooperatives as essentially being, you know, quite burdensome organizations where everyone essentially has to take a decision. And especially now where we've got 400 members and we're looking to expand quite rapidly as well. That definitely isn't the case and it couldn't be the case if we were to be a new, uh, like a media organization. So like a regular month in essence works in, in this way. We've got people who are in the office pretty much every day. We were, we were kind of given some discount space in the center of the city and that serves as like a hub for people to come in and out um, and work. And then for people who can't afford to give up perhaps half a day or a few hours of work to come into the office, we've got weekly content coordination meetings and fortnightly membership and events and fortnightly finance meetings where essentially people can come down, have input on key strategic decisions, whether it be content or finance, and then take away responsibilities to work in the meanwhile. And then there's a monthly uh, co-op meeting where, which is open to all of our members. And we've all explained here in our nice pastel yeah, community all right, organization. So this is, yeah, I mean, if you- Not, it, not like the Bristol Post. Yeah, if you ones. look at in edition one, you can actually um, 
you can see that graphic displayed in a bit more detail. But essentially, the way it works is you've got kind of a wider, you know, wider population of Bristol, and then you've got contributor members um, who are also kind of involved in the production, and membership dues fund the organisation as well. As, as well. some advertising, which is regulated by an advertising charter, which was created through uh, participation by about 70 or 80 members and also some supplementary commission, uh, commission and income that we get from uh, running workshops. We've done some with uh, a couple of universities, a couple of uh, further education colleges, and that's something which we're looking to expand as well for both, obviously, again, like f financial and also sort of impact and political journalistic reasons too. Yeah, so I mean, at, at the moment, yeah, we're like, yeah, we're looking at, um, we're currently, as I said, we're all volunteers, uh, but we're working towards getting to a stage where we can fund the organisation to a capacity where everyone can receive some form of remuneration. We feel that's absolutely essential for practical reasons as well as for political reasons. If we're actually to get, you know, um, people involved in the long term, then that, that, that needs to happen. And we'll go on to the finances in a bit. Um, so who is the Bristol Cable? There's 400 of us. If you look at our board of directors, for instance, you'll see that you've got 18-year-old um, you know, amateur filmmakers, you've got a professor in media uh, law from a local university, you've got a, you know, a, a wide spectrum of people. Um, and, and one of the things, like, like we were saying about the trainings, is that we absolutely make every effort to get like, a range of people involved in producing the Bristol Cable. So we've, got, we've had, like, yeah, one of our recent workshops was uh, basics to freedom of information reporting. We've got another one on um, investigating companies by Corporate Watch coming up again soon. And these are all some of the member benefits which we provide as well, which as a member you get yeah, free access to workshops, you get membership discounts in local businesses, and, uh, and you obviously support the Bristol Cable. Uh, uh, you know, as a whole. And part of this, well, that currently is based around the goodwill and uh, timing of professionals who have that experience and have those skills to pass on. But the idea is, is that we can, you know, produce that within ourselves and within our wider grouping as well. And again, and this is part of our sort of like overall strategy, is finding a mutually compatible relationship between creating a financially sustainable organisation and one which is uh, of, of producing high quality journalism and, and has a high social impact and that's where the training comes in and that's where the sort of the membership model comes in so how can the questions are is how can we create ownership of the Bristol cable in order to both inspire high quality content and then create the demand for it and w then in turn the financial um, revenue and like one of the things that we've been toying with recently as well is like how do we move beyond just like a tokenistic annual general members meeting where people get in, you know have their say or you know cast you know a, a ballot and then walk away and we don't hear or see from them for like for the year and that's you know that's one of the questions we've been addressing through kind of online polling we had for instance uh, a recent poll over you know what the theme of the next edition should be um, you know we, we could try and give a theme to every edition that we've done so far and that's definitely the direction we're moving in and, and you know therefore we can kind of focus in on our, our investigations so we had you know the options of either kind of a, a, a you know more in-depth analysis on the environment broadly speaking or the arms trade Bristol's got like a massive engineering sector with a lot of arms companies and and, and people, you know, voted in favour of the environmental theme this time, partly because Bristol has been voted European Green Capital and wanted to see really what that actually means. You know, is that just like a, is that just like a, a superficial badge or is there kind of more credibility to it? Um, yeah. One of the qu main questions that we get asked is what is our target audience? And um, we've got a couple of issues with that sort of the framing of that question uh, for several reasons. One is the sort of the more obvious developments in moving beyond the relationship between journalist or publisher and passive consumer and audience. And the other is that our audience, as it were, quote unquote, is less based around sort of like narrow demographic indicators or factors like, you know, 20 to 25 year olds or a particular ethnicity or a particular geographical location. Much of it is based around a va value based. Now that kind of sounds a bit cliche, but it's also what are people interested in? What do they find, what's relevant to their lives? And uh, what do they want to participate in and or consume? Now, 
that sort of means that one of the things which we aren't resting on is just like having, uh, relying on our audience being value-based, i.e. they studied humanities at, at university. One of the things that we're actively doing is sourcing content by going to, to communities, by speaking to different interest groups or value groups or whatever that might be represented and determining what you know, sort of stories or issues might be of interest to them and we sort of build up our networks and our sources by focusing on the value-based audience and also the sort of the demographic one as well. You know, that kind of feeds in as well to like, to the logistics of how we distribute. A lot of people kind of ask, you know, why print? But actually, you know, first of all, we're not a news organisation, so it's got a much longer lifeline than, you know, traditional print. But it's also like a great way to get people to a website without, you know, with a paper. It's not just d distributed in cafes in the centre of town. We take it all over the city, you know, from the very like outskirt kind of industrial suburbs to, to the city centre. And, you know, by doing so, we also, um, you know, really kind of capture a lot of these groups that might not otherwise get involved. And there's a bit of a question there about how democratic is our co-op? Because effectively it sort of revolves around taking an issue and then going out and finding someone to, to interview or to find a source or someone to produce it. And some people are like, well, it would be more democratic if you just left it open. But if you le leave it completely open, what we found is that what you end up with is press releases, you end up with people with gripes, you end up with solely co comment pieces, and you end up with kind of plain weird stuff which we don't even want to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, or like legal, <laughs> legal issues. Um, or, um, but so well, that's one of our aims, really, is to move beyond being solely applicable and interesting to politicos and to journos, and out reaching beyond that, capturing that market or that target audience, as it were, but moving beyond that. And one of the ways in which we do that is talking about the sort of um, talking about different things in different ways and on different planes. Now, one, uh, so for example, we have investigations, which we'll come on to later, but we also have voices, features, people's histories. For example, when all of the, th uh, when it's still continuing, but when the um, situation in uh, Syria and Kurdistan first hit the news, we went out and we actively sourced six members of the Syrian community uh, sorry, of the Kurdish Syrian community in Bristol, spoke to them, got them around a round table and had them discussing things about their perspectives, about what they knew. They have family fighting and dying uh, in front of ISIS and the Syrian army and whoever else. And this is what we're aiming to do, is to bring down big national rem uh, international removed issues and put it on a local level, which is relevant and engaging to individuals. Same goes for, we have pieces in Somali, a big Somali population in Somali language and English in Bristol, uh, and sort of various void pieces on countering extremism from a grassroots level, uh, or, or sort of fighting evictions uh, in, in, in Bristol on a local level. So again, connecting big national policy issues straight through to the door to someone's pocket and so on. Other, th other examples of what we do in that case, uh, we had an interesting feature in the election special edition uh, to do with white working class, formerly Labour voters, sp uh, turning to UKIP. Instead of commenting on it like a lot of the sort of the chattering classes do, we went and we spoke to some people. And lo and behold, they're from Avonmouth Docks, a traditionally like blue collar working class area former labor vo uh, labor, lifelong Labour voters, trade unionists, I hate Thatcher, all of this, we're now voting UKIP. And this is like really interesting for us to actually find people and uh, uh, relationships that sort of speak on the personal level and the policy level of what's happening. Same goes for, uh, uh, Alon did a feature on gangs in Bristol and the history of gangs. We also have people's histories which are untold or unknown histories in Bristol and we have a lot of visuals and we have a lot of illustrations and so on. Yeah, and I guess like one of the things that, you know, for us personally, we want to move in a direction of doing more investigative journalism, but it's also, and, you know, and that's a process, that's a steep learning curve for all, all of the people involved. But one of the things that we recognise with having such a diverse range of content is that people come for one thing and then they stay for another. So people might not necessarily, you know, if we had like a, you know, a magazine full of like high quality investigations, hopefully one day, like, people wouldn't necessarily, like, 
go to it. But if there are like those voice pieces, there are those round tables, there are those photos of people who live down your street who you recognize and you see every day, you know, that's a great way to like get people like, you know, exploring other ideas and issues. Yeah, and that's something which we've come across, you know, again, coming back to the politicos and the journals things. If, you've, if we keep and continue and solely to bang on about um, sort of hard news, so-called, people switch off. Unless it's become a h habitual interest or a hobby, people switch off, particularly if they're living those daily realities themselves. It, it gets too personal, it gets too deep. And so we focus on having a breadth of content, a depth of content, and also our style and our presentation. This is one of our illustrations, and you'll see throughout that we focus a lot on our layout and our graphic design, and um, uh, uh, basically our visual representation. And this really is to increase our impact and increase our reach and readability, which for us, again, is the whole point of this exercise. How can we increase the engagement, and therefore how can we increase the membership and therefore, how can we increase the high quality of the content? Now, the next, and then I guess this is an important point to take on a question which some of you may be asking about being in print. Obviously, we have the online uh, website as well, which we'll talk about a bit later. But we publish uh, 10,000 copies every two months with, on our fourth edition, was published yesterday. Um, it's the one with the orange cover, you'll see it, issue four. Um, and one of the most important things for us in getting to this stage has been the print publication. Most, one of the most expensive things being that we're, not, uh, that we're all volunteers currently, but also one of the ways in which we can reach out to different groups and different communities, get sources, get, no, get known. Unless you've got an established brand to just not, you might end up just being an obscure website. And there are a lot of obscure websites with high quality content that don't really get known that much. Particularly if you're wanting to reach out um, beyond digital natives and young people. Like we mentioned, we have a big Somali and immigrant population, like many cities across, uh, across the UK. On the street, one of the streets close to us, there's maybe like 10 or 15 internet cafes along the street. That is demonstrative that not everybody is online all the time and not everybody is always consuming digital media. Uh, the other thing is older people, older crowds and so on who aren't necessarily so at home using uh, uh, digital interfaces. Um, so next, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, our, some of the examples of the investigations that we've done, that we've done. and uh, Alon, take it away. Yeah, so this was like one of the first pieces that we did, which was you know, our kind of attempt to understand what we'd personally experienced working in kitchens or working on shop floors on a wider level. And we looked around, you know, online, speaking to people, trying to get kind of an understanding of what, what research and information there was on the catering sector. And we didn't really find much. Like we phoned up um, the trade union coalition. We asked them, you know, what information did they have, say, on workers in the Southwest uh, working in catering? And they referred us to Bristol City Council and they didn't have any information. And we found that quite like astonishing. And, and then we, you know, so we, we basically, we came up with um, a, a survey method, went out and we collected um, information from over 100 people working in the catering sector in Bristol. There's 14 and a half thousand people working in catering in Bristol. And kind of with our methodology, we kind of thought that, you know, 100 people is, is a representative, just about a representative sample, even though there are obviously issues. It's hard to reach to pe you know, reach people in kitchens who are often working precariously, who you know, have to like, hide the fact that they're answering questions. But we ended up kind of sneaking around, the, from sneaking around the Marriott Hotel to going into the backs of like, cafes and speaking to people and smoking breaks, putting up QR codes with a little you know, a bit of information next to where people like, light up a cigarette you know, on, on walls as well, looking at ways in which we can actually you know, reach out to people who might not otherwise be inclined, and obviously putting out the message on, um, in our own channels you know, through kitchens and getting people to spread the words. Um, and we found as a result that uh, well, we've, there's a lot of information that we, you know, we took from it, and you can look at it in more depth in the first edition. But, uh, for instance, 70% of people work over contracted hours, and 40% of those weren't paid for all of the hours that they worked overtime as well. Um, you know, those are like quite shocking statistics that perhaps, 
you know, people individually, people might, you know, think is just part of the trade, you know, it's part of the stop and trade of working in catering, but we kind of wanted to tackle that, that normal, kind of, that sense of normality, you know, head on and, and challenge also like, you know, for instance, the mayor who came out in favour of a living wage in public statements and we looked at one of his uh, restaurants which uh, he is a co-owner of and found that people were being uh, paid way below the living wage um, so you know like that's you know th 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 those are sort of some of the connections we can make and like Adam was saying earlier as well looking at national international trends and issues through the lens of the local and that's that's how we you know we can make these issues relevant and one of the sort of the key components of this was is that it was done on a sort of a survey method methodological basis um, which admittedly perhaps has some flaws is just kind of like a dip test um, but what that involved was a lot a lot of hours and the way in which we were able to galvanize people like ourselves to do it for free is the people had a sense of involvement, a sense of ownership, knew a lot of people that worked in the sector who could sort of like s spread out uh, and, and around. And um, lo and behold, last week we get a call from BBC Radio 4 doing an investigation into the catering sector saying you're the only source of actual research we've got on the sector, which is one of the biggest and one of the least regulated, one of the most precarious and uh, you know it is rife with problems of human trafficking and exploitation and all of these other things and we only sort of skim the surface on that and looking at in basic employment conditions um, but that's what we feel is a piece of high quality content obviously there's room for improvement the impact however on our on a, on a potential model is that we've got members from it but we completely jeopardize our advertising revenue you know. when we slap, <laughs> slap papers down on cafes with a picture of uh, someone working in a kitchen yeah. saying catering investigation, we didn't exactly get smiles from you know, the it, owners. It was, it was <laughs> over, 30, over 30 central Bristol venues from chains, small, large, independent, you name it, cafes, restaurants and so on. And it was, a, you know, it, it was after coming back and kind of you know, telling a white lie about we're collecting uh, data on you know, the, the, the sector for some... Uh, yeah for uni or something, I can't remember what we said. But, um, with, and then speaking to the, uh, obviously we made it completely transparent and clear to the employees, but this was to sort of get through the, the gauntlet of the supervisors and the managers. Um, you know, coming back like a month later with the magazine and trying to like ask if we can put it on, their, on the side where people would like, you know, collect their coffees was a little bit awkward. But, you know, it's something which we always prioritize and it's something that we're trying to push, is that if we can't do if we're going to sort of like jeopardize our content in order to get advertising, there's no point in doing this and we're going to end up in the vicious cycle of local media, which we've talked about already before. And that also like taps back into jeopardizing advertising revenue, but it's also like, it's also boosting membership. It's boosting membership and it's boosting support and people are like seeing investigative journalism as something that they want to support and see grow and develop into, you know, something more mature and prevalent. Um, so yeah, like another example of like, I'll just, yeah, very briefly, um, look, you know, one of the other investi short investiga investigative piece that we did was look at the links between Bristol City Council and uh, multinationals uh, operating in Qatar. And um, we kind of, you know, found, th looking through kind of city council accounts that quite a lot, uh, there were three main multinational companies, engineering construction companies, uh, EC Harris, Hal Crow, and CH2M Hill and uh, ACOM, actually four, uh, but three of those, yeah, they, um, they were involved in multinational um, operations in Qatar. Building the World Cup. Building the World Cup, and we were speaking to uh, Human Rights Watch out there who um, were speaking about, you know, uh, the, essentially the kafala system, which probably some of you are familiar with, where basically um, migrant workers need a kind of in-country sponsor, usually their employer, and that kind of gives rise to exploitative conditions. And, uh, and you know, we found like on construction sites that they were operating, that they were kind of serious human rights, um, you know, allegations being made against them. And at the same time, the council was contracting these exact same companies to pounds. build uh, one of the biggest infrastructure projects in Bristol of recent history, which is the Bristol Arena, yeah. which is hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and, you know, contracted by the independent elected mayor who is a, uh, you know, sort of a darling of the, the green 
movement and ethical movement and so on. Again, ruffling a few feathers, cutting our ties with anybody who's got resources, but promoting our membership. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, that's, and then the next one is kind of related as well. Um, basically, the, Alon explained earlier that Bristol has been granted Bristol Green Capital status as a European uh, uh, award. Uh, which is sort of like celebrating uh, green initiatives and sustainability initiatives and everything else, which is great. Don't get us wrong. We like that. We want it to succeed. But we're looking behind the surface, and what we find is that 1.35 million pounds of government money, uh, public national money, was given to Bristol to distribute to community projects that or otherwise uh, initiatives and social enterprises and so on to promote the green agenda in Bristol, to promote the green economy, inclusivity, and so on. What we found was is that almost uh, 500,000 of it, so half a million, was given directly to organisations with close links to the awarding body. Now, whereas the catering investigation was collaborative work between lots of people, dozens of people, and field-based research, this was two people, uh, Alon and I were supporting, but not leading this particular one, and actually getting into the heart of the local government, speaking to councillors, speaking to council officials, and so on. And uh, essentially what we found was is that um, people on the board of the awarding body who administered uh, the grants, 136 groups applied for the grants, and 32 were accepted, 10 of which Bristol 2015 Green Capital board members own, work or manage. So they're either directors, owners or senior employees. And that's £500,000 worth of public money. In an interview later with uh, the mayor, he implied some legal action because he thought that there was some sort of uh, misconstrual of the evidence. And uh, giving him the benefit of the doubt, although not conceding, we started to look a bit further. And what we find is that the independent assessment panel, which is meant to be even further removed from the board, two out of three of the people on the independence assessment panel had received were, one was the dean of a university department, Bristol University Department, and the other was um, involved with a uh, events company in Bristol, had received grants of 50,000 pounds. And <laughs> we asked the question, is it so hard to find three people in Bristol qualified to judge these grants applications while not applying for the grants themselves? <coughs> Apparently not. Next one, this is our most recent one, you'll find it in the latest edition on uh, page four or five if you've got it in front of you, is we decided to uh, take a look at um, Bristol University's investments and at their institutional investments. And there's a lot of noise currently around, you know, sort of the divestment campaign, being ethical and all of these sorts of things. And we're not trying to ruin the ethical party, but we're just trying to like, you know, give it a little bit of scrutiny and hold it up to slightly higher standards than it, what we see effectively as greenwashing and uh, a lot of other sort of uh, noise that's being made around these. So effectively, this was our sort of first foray into uh, data journalism and data visualization. So we got the freedom of inf through freedom of information request, all of Bristol University's investments, had to fight them a little bit for the amount of the investments, um, and then lined them all up on a spreadsheet that looked like this, and there's about two or three columns this way. Uh, got about uh, 10 or so other people and went through every single one according to ethical indicators, tax, human rights, consumer rights, uh, environment, um, uh, corruption and fraud, and found that amongst the 189 companies, um, there was 205 ethical violations uh, amongst the 56 million pound portfolio. And all of that was sourced directly and currently uh, back to nothing before 2010 to keep it current and was based around regulators, government regulators fining or sanctioning the companies, uh, verified media reports, NGO reports, and so on. And here's a couple of the ones in which they're involved in. Is Barclays Bank, HSBC, Shell, Amazon, and Daily Mail may sound different, uh, ethical? We don't think so. But we, what we aim to do is effectively was back it up. And this is what we came up with, as well as the sort of the print version. We have an article explaining our methodology and so on. And this is powered by Tableau Public, which is the free version of a really good uh, data visualization program 
and we break it down by sector, break it down by ethical violation by sector, um, a little closer look at fossil fuel investments, uh, two, over two and a half million pounds worth in fossil fuels, um, and uh, looking at uh, the financial sector, which was the biggest sector, um, and also a company by company breakdown of all of the all of the one, all of the companies that they were invested in. Now we spoke to Bristol University about this, um, and they promised us that their fund manager um, was m managing the fund appropriately, and it was completely in line with their ethical policy. The ethical policy sets a very, very, very low bar. It's basically anything which isn't illegal in the UK. Um, you know, which is, which is, you know, okay, but they're using the term ethical in order to promote this agenda. And it's, it's the, our duty, we see, as to sort of, you know, provoke some questioning of this agenda before it sort of just completely uh, dominates the narrative. Uh, they informed us that their fund manager was managing it correctly and so on. We look into their fund manager, they've got funds in Luxembourg, Cayman Islands and so on. <laughs> their very fund manager is effectively facilitating uh, tax avoidance at least. Next, this is less maybe of a sort of uh, investigation as such, but it's something which we're aiming to sort of talk about um, presenting information and data in a way which is interesting and visualizing, uh, visualizing it and accessible. This, is ju this was just prior to the election we did this and we broke down 2010 campaign spending by candidate, by all of the candidates running in the Bristol area uh, and broke it down by the cost of each vote. So kind of a, a crude analysis but actually provoking bigger questions about, uh, I don't know how much you can see here but you can see it in the addition uh, you, you know, if each, if there was some sort of public funding for campaigns, how much would each party do better? Because there's clearly a correlation between who spends the most and who and who makes the most uh, and who gets the most votes. Even if their actual cost per vote is dramatically uh, not not valued compared to the smaller parties. So, for example, in some of the cases, the Green Party, if they spent as much as the Conservatives or the or the Labour Party, would have. Uh, uh, one or come a close second. <coughs> um, oops. This is again a, um, a, a, a effectively a data visualization. Call it investigation if you like, but you know maybe doesn't meet th that high standard that we're that we're trying to set for ourselves. But it's basically trying to take the national issue of the housing crisis and look at who's actually doing it and how is it actually happening. So we take the four or five major developments in Bristol at the moment and look at how many affordable housing that how much affordable housing they're actually building and how much affordable housing they're required to build under the council pol uh, planning uh, policies. And as you'll see in some cases in the, for the council, it's meant to be 30 to 40 percent. In some cases, it's zero. In others, it's seven, 10 percent. These are the ways in which, and then we explain a little bit the ways in which, effectively, the uh, developers are bullying councils and running rings around them in terms of their contracting and uh, the sort of the, the, the legal exchanges that go on uh, um, regarding uh, planning policy and so on. Um, where are we? No, I think, you know, one of the things like all of the cases that have just been raised now, they've oft, you know, they've involved public institutions where we can request information through F, uh, like freedom of information requests. But one of the, like, the direction that we are also heading in and is, is looking at private businesses and organised crime to some extent as well within the city. And that that really brings up that poses a lot of challenges. And we've had like. Now, we want the Bristol Cable in the future to be like the go-to place for people with tip-offs and whatever else. And we're starting to get a bit of that. And we've had a few instances, for instance, um, you know, uh, one person recently who came to us um, with co quite serious allegations of uh, regarding like organised crime. And, um, and you know, that's, that's something that we as individuals have to... Have to go in, whoa. Have to assess. <laughs> Slow down. Because first of all, we're not professional, we're not trained, we're not well-resourced. But it's obviously something that we really want to take head on. And, and it's also like a fairly small city where it's half, just under half a million people, but you do bump into people on the streets and like, that's something that we're considering. And then, obviously, and then there's also like another business, for instance, that we've been for eight months now trying to get, uh, you know, really trying to investigate that we know there's some serious stuff going on, on in there. But we also know that, you know, if there's no margin for error 
and um, and you know that's something that we've really got to consider as well. Yeah, and that's something which um, you know is in terms of content, we've always been very uh, strict about making margins uh, about errors and you know potentially not just you know the risks of uh, uh, lawsuits and litigation, but you know the sort of the bigger questions about ruining somebody's livelihood if we get something wrong. Like it's not about us. Like they can come and take the Bristol cables fifteen hundred pounds, <laughs> you know. But like you know, if we if 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 we if we damage somebody's personal reputation, that means our credibility is ruined, and most importantly, their their sort of personal life and professional life would be as well. But back to the sort of why we're producing some of this content is that we are aiming to talk, making it relevant, making it necessary, and making it interesting and provocative as well. And um, that's you know sort of our, our aim, our sort of like broad editorial approach is that is this relevant? Is it is too esoteric? Is it too sort of removed from people's lives? And how can we draw that connector so we can talk about you know what does climate change mean for your daily lives? And you know and how we can actually provoke people to be engaged in those ways. And uh, you know that's sort of partly why we're proposing this alternative as to move beyond the critique about uh, the media and to look for alternatives that are financially and, and journalistically viable and, and interesting and come back to the sort of like the Bristol Post here because everybody can bash the post and the, the media and so on and like you know it's kind of like the media the big boogeyman but we're actually looking about how we can challenge that in an informed and professional way and make it um, a, a sustainable organization and um, a, an accessible one and a broad one as well without you know sort of watering it down too much like we always say straight off the bat don't believe in objectivity we prefer transparency publish all of our accounts we publish you know sort of uh, if it's a comment piece or an opinion piece or a bit of both or whatever we mention it and that's something that we think uh, you know is an important something to be clear about because it's sometimes left unsaid. Yeah, and there is like a broad range of opinions within like the, among, between the contributors as well. There isn't a set editorial line, which we do have an ed editorial policy that was drawn up by members that you can view online as well, which was a kind of a crowdsourced editorial policy, which was like another way in which we consulted people. But yeah, we, there is absolute room for, for, you know, for different perspectives and for different, you know, like takes on key issues. And that's, you know, something that we absolutely kind of celebrate and make ensure like is consistently like there. But like going back to like, you know, we've, we've discussed like the landscape of media, a bit about our structure and organisation. We're not posing the Bristol Cable, we're not posing it as like a blueprint for how, you know, the deficit of like quality local media can be addressed. But we are saying that we're, you know, giving it a shot and it's time for people to start getting more imaginative as well. And this is, you know, we've been having conversations with people in uh, Manchester, Brighton, uh, London, uh, all over the UK, Congo. Congo. <laughs> Actually, there was you know one one guy who saw the Bristol Cable and said he wanted to start up a media cooperative in Kinshasa, and um, you know it's like it's basically about having those conversations and looking at ways in which we can start reimagining how media on a local level can work because we've had so many people from local authorities from different organizations who are coming up to us and going you know what like this is this has been missing for so long like not necessarily the bristol cable but having a source for discussing what's going on in our cities and like perhaps like regional news doesn't sound as sexy as like exploring like international like scandals and whatever else but it is absolutely essential we believe anyway and and totally connected like like it can be through some of the investigations that we've shown and as you know as we kind of move in, in you know in the next you know coming years has been like you know gove has been like discussing placing more restrictions on fois you've got you know the develop you know a, a more unregulated private sector that's growing as well all of these sorts of issues really kind of pose a serious risk to to our, to our communities, we, be, we believe. And, and that's why we, you know, put forward me, local quality media as a public good that needs to be there. So, so what's next or where, where are we trying to go? The one thing is obviously building on what we do in terms of our content. Really interested in planning. Sounds really boring, but really isn't. 
interested in uh, sort of expanding our sort of like data uh, and interactive capacities, uh, looking around uh, PFIs and various other elements, as well as maintaining our breadth, as I mentioned before, with the voices and the features and the histories and so on. Next, training, getting skilled up, being here is great. And also like we're doing, we're doing that with people, often a lot of young people, a lot of kind of just disenfranchised or disenchanted, so-called marginalized people. It's true, but often there's people that are bored. There's a lot of people who've got skills, who've got ideas, who've got and are motivated, but are ended up doing really boring jobs, uninspiring jobs. And we're basically trying to say like, yeah, you've got to do that because we can't pay you yet. But you know, help us build this and we'll work on something together and we can actually potentially make it happen. The other thing is uh, experimenting with our sort of like democratic organization uh, and trying to find you know, radical and efficient ways of ongoing and, uh, and participation, meaningful consultation, so on. Again, coming back to why it's important for the values and the impact of the organization and for the business side. How can we get members? And that's the crucial thing. So we can get members, then we can become a, a viable organization. And then we can start paying people, which is always for uh, uh, sort of operational and political reasons, something that we've uh, held up as a principle from the start. Currently, we have 400 members from launching in late October. If we get 1,000 members, that's one in every 437 people in Bristol, then we'll be able, we'll have like a solid bedrock of being able to pay everybody from distributors, graphic designers, illustrators, operations, contributors, rent, all of that sort of stuff, supplemented by some advertising and other sources of income, uh, a stipend at least, or like, you know, a, a contribution per article or per, per piece of work. And, uh, you know, beyond that, it's about expanding on an alternative models or versions of something like this. If this doesn't go anywhere further or doesn't develop into something that can actually be sustainable, at least it sets a blueprint for others who want to work on something more. And also to take things away from being solely uh, um, uh, London-centric or localised-centric um, experiment or alternative. The idea is, is this can be replicated in all major cities around the world and in the UK as more and more urbanization becomes the place where people live and uh, localism and the sort of like direct involvement becomes you know the sort of the, 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 the aim of the game and the sort of the, the aim for people to be involved today. Well thank you very much come speak to us later grab a Yeah, grab a few copies if you like, and uh, you check us out online. We just published the fourth edition yesterday, and uh, so there will be content being uploaded from the fourth edition from now. Thanks a lot.